Uh, thank you very much. Um, I should say that uh, after our next speaker, we're um, delighted to have Yale's political science uh, eminence uh, Professor Doug Ray, author of City, a remarkable book that deals with the origins of some of these problems uh, in our very own city, um, who will moderate the questions afterwards. But first, Tom Vanderbilt. Okay, great. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, great to see such a, a big turnout here. Um, I was just at a conference down in, in Austin for the Texas Department of Transportation, and one of the commissioners there was decrying what he thought, you know, the, the view of transportation as essential and important to our lives. Uh, the view of transportation in the av to the average sort of person, uh, as he put it in, I thought, a very Texas way, is about as uh, sexy as putting socks on a rooster. Um, but, uh, and... Uh, so, in, to use Don's analogy of, of dogs and cats, I, I tend to think I was more of sort of a pigeon, uh, kind of flitting about the, the streets, uh, picking up what I could here and there from all sorts of different aspects of uh, traffic. And this is the book I've written. Don is one of the many people in it, uh, people wh whose work I was really trying to bring to this wider public. And I'm not, uh, I'm a journalist by training, no background in transportation planning or anything like that. It, just the presence of this here is making me very uh, nervous. These, these, these are the sorts of things I would typically skip in uh, a lot of transportation papers and get to the conclusion and find out the truth. But um, so anyway, so this is the book I've written. Uh, it's been published in a number of different countries, which has been published in a number of different countries, which is uh, interesting. I'm sorry, I'm switch to this. Uh, and it, this is a fascinating process, not, with, not without a few moments lost in translation. The, uh, if you notice the German edition down here in the lower left-hand corner, they went with the title Auto instead of Traffic. And I, I called up the publisher. I said, this is a little bit, uh, I'm curious about this. It's not really a book about the car. It's more about traffic. He said, well, Tom, in, in German, the word traffic is actually synonymous with the word for intercourse. Um, I spent a few minutes on the phone trying to explain why this actually wouldn't be a bad thing to confuse in the mind of a uh, consumer. <laughs> But um, he didn't buy that. So I just wanted to uh, begin. So I live in Brooklyn. I have a particularly unique uh, relationship to parking. I, I do own a car, which is a very strange thing. And we have a very interesting form of what's called transportation demand management in New York City, which is that you basically don't leave your space. You don't ever drive because of fear of not only losing the great space you have, but of encountering uh, the sort of angry natives when you return and do something wrong. But this, uh, you know, even within New York, a minority of car owner, uh, New Yorkers actually own cars, but even within New York, there's interesting variations between neighborhoods. I know there's a Jackson Heights uh, resident, former Jackson Heights residence here somewhere, and interesting study looked at two uh, neighborhoods in Brooklyn, which is where I live, and, you know, if you were a transportation planner sort of looking at this, you might go up and down the line here and think that, well, Park Slope here, it's a wealthier uh, part of town, there's actually more cars there. Sure, certainly they must be sending more vehicles to the central business district. Uh, in fact, it was actually Jackson Heights sent about uh, something like 40 percent more people were actually driving to the central business district. And the reason was is that Jackson Heights people tend to have uh, little parking spaces protected. They have curb cuts, they have garages. So this is you know something that the mere presence of this protected parking spot in, emboldened them to drive and, and, and change their behavior in a way that, uh, you know, it's sort of economics 101, incentives matter, uh, whereas I am I'm quite afraid to ever drive anywhere. And this, uh, you know, th this is sort of 1970 image, uh, sort of the high point of, of giving over the city to the automobile. And I'm a child of the early 1970s, and it's been interesting to sort of note the sort of unsustainable path we've been on. I mean, we talk about the American uh, love affair with the automobile, but, you know, it, it, and some people joke that it's long, long ago turned into a marriage, but it's interesting for me to track how, how much this has changed even in the past few decades since uh, I've been around. Uh, but a, another way to look at parking here, this is uh, Brian Pijanowski, a geographer at Purdue, who did a sort of a heat map here of all the available parking spaces in Tippecanoe County, Indiana. These are just the municipal sort of parking lot. Uh, this isn't residential stuff. He found there were basically uh, three times as many parking spaces as there were actual residents in the town, that uh, the parking, uh, parking lots occupied 20% more space than the businesses they served, that if you were to extend this relationship to, the, uh, country, to, the, to America, uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts would have to be turned entirely into parking lots, and that basically if everyone in this county got up and drove around at the same time, uh, there would be something on the order of 250,000 parking spaces still available, so just sort of sitting there. So massive sort of overabundance of, uh, of parking and, uh, and I should say, road space. Uh, the uh, Rand uh, 
Rand Corporation has estimated that 90% of American roads are not congested 90% of the time. So, but you know, uh, this is another thing that's changed uh, remarkably. In 1960, this was almost unheard of, a three-car garage. Now one in five new home starts uh, has one of these. And what's interesting is that this sort of uh, relationship began to change even as American households were getting smaller, and arguably houses should have been getting smaller, but it sort of speaks to the idea that we sometimes hear uh, talk about the population increase contributing con congestion. In some cases it does, but what's really changed over the past few decades is this incredible increase in vehicle miles traveled, which is BMT, of course, from 1968 to 2000. Uh, the population grew about 40%. The number of vehicle mile tr my miles traveled increased 160%. So uh, I, I sort of, and most of this, I should say, was uh, what's called discretionary driving. This is not work-related uh, commuting, this, this uh, driving. So I tend to blame the rise of uh, organized youth uh, soccer for this sort of uh, vast uh, increase that was going on here. But there were some other things kind of rising at a similar rate uh, during that period. And we, we, lay a, we lay a lot of blame at the foot of sort of corn syrup and, and things like that. But, um, you know, clearly there's this tracks the uh, VMT increase pretty well, and Sheldon Jacobson has pointed out that as, as Americans have gotten heavier, this is of course in a sort of perverse uh, feedback loop. Our fuel economy has declined because it, it requires more energy to move uh, these heavier Americans around, so it's sort of a negative feedback loop. Of course, we have ways of, of counteracting uh, these, uh, this obesity thing. This is, uh, we drive to the gym, and um, this is an actual, uh, this is San Diego, actual, actual gym. Some people think this photo was doctored, but borrowed this from uh, Dan Burden, because it's a great image, but... Now this, uh, talk about being a child of the 70s, this is an iconic uh, house, the Brady Bunch house, and we think about, you know, suburbia, obviously, people do more driving, but e even, again, in, the, in these past few decades, as a measure of how things have changed, uh, the Brady Bunch house on, on the Walk Score website, interestingly, scores an 82, which is, it's not the 98% that my Brooklyn neighborhood does, but it's still pretty decent compared to what's come along since then, which is places like Henderson, Nevada, one of the epicenters of the subprime crisis, where you're getting walk scores in the neighborhood about 50. Uh, so, now just another thing that has changed uh, in that time. First McDonald's drive through came around in 1975. I always thought this happened much earlier, but uh, McDonald's now does a majority of their business through the drive through So McDonald's is sort of a nice uh, little icon of, of car dependency. McDonald's has become a car-dependent country. So you know, these demographic things were interesting. It wasn't, wasn't what really motivated me to write the book. What really motivated me was uh, just some sort of questions I had as a, as a long-time driver, participant in this, this environment that I think is so ubiquitous and yet so overlooked. And I was trying to uh, sort of understand some of the things about the behavior of, of other drivers, about the way traffic worked, to sort of understand uh, this environment. And so I had simple questions in mind that I wanted to ask. And I want to show you a clip from a film that I think demonstrates one of these traffic uh, phenomena quite well. We could just go through this as an office space. The phenomenon I'm talking about is the sensation uh, you may have in traffic that the other lane is always moving faster. Now this is a really uh, a real phenomenon that I think we've all experienced. And uh, what's interesting though is that some, some Canadian researchers actually identified what was going on here as an interesting cognitive illusion. Because about 90% of our time spent in driving is uh, we're looking forward, which sort of makes sense. There's something that happens by which we actually spend more time watching other vehicles physically pass us than we see ourselves passing other vehicles. Uh, this illusion is made worse by the closer we drive to the car in front of us. 
and the more glances we make in the neighboring lane, it increases the sense of this uh, illusion. So we always sort of feel like we're coming out on the losing end in a traffic situation. This, I think, plays into what Daniel Kahneman has called loss aversion, by which the human brain actually registers losses much more powerfully than it does gains. So, uh, and this is a case, if you talk to many traffic engineers, they would say, well, in many cases, it would be better if, if no one actually changed lanes. What, what seems best for the individual user, user optimality, actually makes the system work. This guy's probably changing lanes because someone did what he did uh, about a mile ahead, and there's sort of a, something called a butterfly effect that can happen that uh, is almost a version of chaos theory. So, now, another question I had was uh, this idea of congestion. Does it, was it always an, um, an instance of there not being enough capacity? Was there always a bottleneck? Was there a result of an accident, an on-ramp, adding new vehicles onto a system? Some Japanese physicists did a fascinating experiment. They got a closed uh, track and asked a group of drivers to maintain a steady speed and following distance and to keep this up for as long as they could. And you'll see that because humans are not uh, robotic devices that over time, a, a bit of sort of uh, noise begins to enter the system. People begin to drive closer. They uh, fail to react in time. They overreact. They brake harder than they should. And out of this uh, sort of perfect closed system, stop and go congestion uh, begins to emerge uh, uh, just through the sheer actions of drivers. And it's an interesting modeling done where looking at people on cell phones because you have a delayed reaction, people on cell phones actually uh, actually exacerbating the situation and making it worse. Now there is. Uh, a solution that's out there, which I, I wrote in uh, in New York about a year ago. This is a, a vehicle called Junior, which is the Stanford University entry in the uh, DARPA Urban Challenge race. Fully autonomous Volkswagen Passat I drove for a few blocks in him. Uh, Junior can sort of see everything around with LiDAR and a variety of sensors. Uh, unlike many New York City drivers, he actually uh, has full compliance with uh, various traffic signals like stop signs. And after a few blocks, you sort of get used to the idea that you're being piloted around by this uh, automatic vehicle, and of course, Junior would have no trouble maintaining the steady speed and following distance. So this is one version of the future uh, which is coming. Now, another idea of the way we contribute to our own traffic problems, of course, the famous one is rubbernecking, and some, some Dutch researchers uh, sent me this a while ago, and they did an interesting experiment and waited for a crash to happen uh, on a Dutch highway, <laughs> and uh, this was a, a van rollover on the top here, and luckily not, not fatal, but what you see is Obviously, there's, there's a, a, a capacity drop in the top section here. People are having to move over, do some merging activity. There's uh, about a 12% uh, reduction, I think they estimated. But what's interesting, so there's a physical bottleneck, but if you look at the very wide median strip across there, uh, there's actually vehicles are slowing exactly where the van is. There's sort of a mental bottleneck that has emerged. Uh, and they also modeled that the uh, drivers were emerging from this queue slower than they would in normal stop and go congestion. So clearly that accident is having an effect on them. They're sort of uh, distracted, perhaps pausing to contemplate their own uh, mortality. And so this is something we all sort of know anecdotally happens, but it's nice to see the actual uh, data out there and, and have this stuff modeled. So uh, the reviewer for the New York Times suggested that my book should be called simply Idiots. Um, <laughs> and this was one, one, one question I was tasked with, with, which was why people seem to do these dumb things on the road. As, as a California Highway Patrol officer put it to me, why we seem to act as if we were suffering from a cranial rectal inversion. Uh, but part of the problem, I think, is we often underestimate the sheer complexity of driving. Now, it's been estimated that, for example, at every two miles, the average driver makes 400 observations, 40 decisions, and one mistake. But the idea, and, and I was really trying to get to this idea that, that Jacques Tati got to in his, his film Traffic, which I would recommend if you haven't seen it, which is the idea that we become different people when we enter uh, an automobile. And, now clearly, you know, for, for the traffic engineers in the house tonight, uh, managing traffic and mobility is sort of a long-standing problem. This is an image that comes from the ruins of Pompeii. You see the chariot ruts uh, still extend in the street. Uh, people, they've put uh, these sort of walkways across there uh, so pedestrians can cross without being drenched by mud. And you see it's lined up perfectly so that the chariots can cross through these uh, crossings. There's kind of an interesting echo of today's uh, speed cushions, which traffic calming devices, which have nice cuts, so emergency vehicles can drive over them uh, faster than, than normal cars. So uh, Pompeii even had uh, some early uh, bollards, uh, devices to block uh, vehicles from using certain streets. Uh, and this idea of, of managing different modes of mobility and, and tension on the road, road, road rage, the modern phrase, is in fact not modern at all. This is Claude Geo painting from the 19th century. Uh, and y y just when things, uh, some managing these various modes has, has long standing, been a long-standing problem. And uh, just when it seemed that, as if things could not get more complicated on the road, along came this new form of personal mobility. 
uh, the first real innovation since Caesar's Rome, which upset this uh, fragile balance. I'm talking here about the bicycle, of course, this uh, incredibly controversial uh, device in the late 19th century. The New York Times uh, declared them rubbershod missiles of the highway. Uh, horse carriages didn't want them in the street. Pedestrians didn't want them on the sidewalk. Where do you put this thing? Strange new etiquette questions. Should men yield to women? Uh, and, and so this is ancient sort of problem. And it brings up something that's been termed a, a modal bias, which when you enter a car, this idea that you become sort of transformed to another uh, form of person, this comes from the uh, Motor Mania, which is a Walt Disney short from the 1950s. I think it's at this wonderfully, it's, it stars uh, Goofy the dog, begins life as Mr. Walker, very sort of innocent person, wouldn't hurt anyone, becomes a homicidal maniac the moment he enters. Where there's a will, uh, there's a way. <laughs> So I, I think you know, humans have trouble uh, often looking outside of ourselves, and there's something that psychologists talk about which is called the fundamental attribution error, uh, but sort of in which we, we basically attribute the actions of others to something about their nature or their character, and we're, when we're asked to explain our own actions, uh, we attribute it to situational factors. Uh, you fell, I was pushed, is how this is a nice phrase to sort of summarize this, and I think we see this in driving a lot, in part because of stress, and part because we're often acting on such imperfect information. We, we make judgments based on the slightest bit of external information, such as uh, a person's license plate. And uh, this is one of the iron laws of driving. In America, the worst drivers are always in the neighboring state. Uh, and you know, sometimes we get this information quite wrong in interesting ways. One of my favorite studies looked at, uh, showed students looked at two, two clips of a car being driven, a BMW and a sort of smaller VW. They were asked a week later to estimate uh, the speed that each vehicle was traveling at. The firm majority of uh, subjects said the BMW must have been driven faster. Uh, in fact, they were driven at exactly the same speed. So we have these sort of mental models of what's happening out there that uh, often don't uh, cor correlate to reality. So now, now one classic problem with, with traffic and, and driver behavior is uh, anonymity. And psychologists also talk about this thing, the online disinhibition effect, uh, in which we sort of sign on to an anonymous chat room. We're protected behind a username that is not our own. Uh, we're free to sort of act how we want to act without any repercussion. Uh, I think you can think of traffic in this way with millions of sort of anonymous users interacting daily, uh, protected by our license plates. Uh, and this, you know, sort of, we, 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 don't, we do not see the same people twice in traffic, which is sort of an obvious thing, but it brings up some interesting uh, experimental games that have been done in economics looking at trying to get people to cooperate. When you have to do things like contribute money to a common pool, uh, the cooperation rate seems to soar when people have the ability to punish people in later rounds. So in traffic, we, we sort of lack this, this accountability, the ability to punish other people. And of course, there have been some websites that have come up where you can uh, sort of you know, make comments about other drivers, but not a lot of people actually look at these systems, which makes it uh, tricky. So now, a somewhat related problem is overconfidence. Drivers are famously overconfident. And one place uh, overconfidence flourishes is in the lack of a face of feedback. Now, pilots, airline pilots are trained rigorously in the importance of accepting feedback from their co-pilots. Drivers are less receptive to this uh, sort of feedback from their passengers, uh, to put it politely. But passengers are, are literally life-saving devices. Studies have been done. Solo drivers are involved in, in crashes at a higher rate than people with passengers. One reason passengers are so good for us is that they provide something we're often missing in driving, which is feedback. And uh, interesting work done uh, neurologically looking at, uh, the, at the mind of a driver while they're in a simulated driving environment versus a passenger. Entirely different neural networks being activated. They are, in essence, different people. Uh, on the notion of feedback, I've, for the last few months, had a small device plugged into the uh, onboard diagnostic port on my car, which measures, uh, which is that thing that sort of mechanics look at when your check engine light goes on. and actually has a lot of interesting information that courses through that that's pretty much ignored. And with an accelerometer and a GPS device, this little device I plugged in there tracks my driving and tells me all sorts of things about it. it gives me a report card at the end of the month, things like hard braking, jackrabbit starts, even idling. And idling is one of these, you know, the sort of American idol. Uh, is we, we consume the amount of energy that Costa Rica ex extends in a year just by, just by our, excuse me, just by our idling. So you know, often people aren't aware of this behavior, and feedback is another mechanism to make them aware. And I've sort of, even driving up here today, uh, the CEO of this company, whose name is David, I, I sort of have 
started to call the device David. It's sitting in my car. I sort of feel like he's watching over me as I'm driving. Someone cuts in front of me. I have to brake harder than I want to. I sort of think, David's going to think I was driving recklessly, but it was really that person's fault. Uh, so one problem with feedback, though, is delivering it effectively. And a guy named Clifford Nass at Stanford has done some interesting research uh, for BMW. They found out when male drivers were given uh, warnings by a female voice in their car that their driving needed to be improved, uh, their driving actually deteriorated. So <laughs> I think <laughs> another problem with traffic is that we lack traditional signals for human communication, which uh, Americans in particular are constantly trying to say things to one another. But I think that traffic is sort of a living laboratory of human interaction. I took this image in. Uh, Beijing, a place where one form of transportation is yielding uh, to another quite literally. But it's a place thriving with these sort of subtle displays of implied power. It's basically a, a giant applied psychology laboratory. And this is, a, you can see this uh, at work in parking lots appropriately. One of my favorite studies looked at um, people who were waiting to vacate their parking space. They found that uh, when this was actually measured, when another driver was waiting uh, for that driver to leave the parking space, the person took longer uh, to leave that space than when no one was waiting. Even though in surveys they said they, they wouldn't do this. But another great place to see this uh, behavior at work is at um, intersections, traffic lights. And psychologists will do an interesting experiment where they'll stop a car at a red light, wait till the light turns green, and then not move that vehicle. And then measure who's sort of behind there, how quickly they honk, how many times they honk, how long each honk is. Because honking, you know, is sort of a subtle language going on there. And I find that the patterns are not, uh, decidedly not random. Uh, men honk more quickly than women. People in expensive cars are quicker to the horn than people driving more modest vehicles. Uh, people in convertibles with the top down were less likely to honk than others uh, when the driver ahead appeared, appeared to be from a different country. And when the driver ahead appeared to be on a cell phone, this generated a faster honk than uh, in other, uh, other conditions. Excuse me. So, uh, you know, there's all, all sorts of these, you know, almost subconscious behaviors going out there as we move around without, uh, and we don't necessarily think about it, which is one of the things that fascinates me about the traffic environment. This is uh, a guy named Ian Walker, who was also in the book, a traffic psychologist from England, did an interesting set of experiments, rode around on his bike, hooked it up with a sensor, which measured the distance of passing cars to his bicycle. He, he rode in a different uh, variety of different uh, conditions. He put a helmet on, he did not put a helmet on, and, and he wore sort of a what he deemed to be a feminine wig, and found that people's passing distances varied with each condition. When, when he had the helmet on, drivers passed more closely to him than when he was not wearing the helmet. And when he had the uh, feminine wig, drivers actually gave him more space. This might have just been uh, confusion that it was actually weird Al Yankovic, but um, that's just. <laughs> now, another thing that Ian uh, has, has talked a lot about is the importance of eye contact in the traffic environment, and something that we don't necessarily think about that much, but something that is generally missing. If you look at the image on the left, I'm not sure if this works uh, way in the back there, but something probably looks a little bit off about this image. And what's happening is that Ian's, uh, one of his eyes is slightly shifted by a few pixels out of a field of hundreds. And we're incredibly sensitive to this. We can sort of pick it out uh, from across the room. And psychologists have even done uh, eye tracking experiments where they look at where people are looking when they first look at an image of a car and they uh, find that their eyes are drawn to the headlights, which resemble eyes. And there's a good reason we're so sensitive to this eye contact, because it's an important tool in gaining social cooperation. And a lot of uh, studies have, have shown this. One of my favorite took place in a university break room. There was an uh, honor system for paying for coffee. Take your coffee, put in uh, the requested amount. And above the coffee machine, they put on alternating weeks an image of uh, human eyes or an image of flowers. And you see on the, on the weeks that the uh, human eyes were there that the donations actually uh, soared. And obviously, they don't need to be real human eyes. And uh, week number one, interestingly, had sort of the highest compliant rate, uh, compliance rate there with the sort of the, the scary set of eyes. So uh, will this work in, in traffic uh, is sort of an interesting question. This is a, from an artistic traffic calming project in St. Paul, Minnesota, which has actually been pretty successful. And they've just renewed it. Uh, but. <laughs> So, you know, I think one of the themes in the, in the book is how people sort of react to the road environment as a piece of design and how this has sort of been neglected, I think, by traffic engineers over the last few decades, but is, is becoming to be viewed with more importance. And instead of simply erecting more signs, we're beginning to think about other ways we can inform drivers about how to behave in certain environments. And when I began this book, this was something that I sort of grew up with and, and still see all over, and I thought, 
oh, it, you know, isn't that nice? People, people sort of care about our, our children. They're, they're out there sort of trying to protect them. And uh, it turns out that these signs uh, have been shown to do absolutely nothing at all in terms of speed reduction or improve the safety of children. They've sort of been banned from uh, the official MUTCD uh, because they essentially don't work. What usually happens is that people are complaining about people driving fast down their street. They call up the local engineers who put up one of these as sort of a, a parental pacification device and, uh, and, then, and then walk away. Now, so, you know, speed management is, is sort of a, a huge issue, uh, <laughs> huge issue in America where in New York City we're about to try to get a, a sort of 20 mile an hour uh, uh, speed limit campaign going, Tw 20 is plenty is, is the idea here, but uh, a lot of different approaches to managing speed. Uh, one, interesting one here in uh, Japan, the Melody Road, it, it features feedback that if you uh, drive over it at the proper speed, uh, it plays a song. If you don't drive over it, it doesn't play the song. So, uh, just another approach in Durham, North Carolina. Now, one reason, you know, to think about why drivers might be speeding is that there's a variety of sort of visual illusions that happen when we're in the car. And this is one of my favorite illusions. It's uh, essentially called the treadmill effect. And the idea here is to stare at the X in the center as, as carefully as you can, very closely as you can. And if it works, you should see the uh, Buddha sort of loom out at you. Is that working for everyone? And you know, what's going on here is that the, uh, similar to the treadmill in a gym, when you run on it for a while and then you stop and the room seems to surge backwards, uh, when you drive at a higher speed, at a certain speed for a good amount of time and then attempt to slow down, the longer you've been driving at that higher speed, the longer it actually takes you to slow down for your brain to sort of mentally catch up. The neurons that, that track forward and backward motion are getting confused. Uh, it's sort of a long story, but so engineers, uh, you know, sort of are forced to put up these dynamic signs that actually remind drivers of how fast they're going as they're uh, entering an, an environment. But uh, another problem, though, is that a lot of people are living on streets like this, and no matter what signs uh, an engineer is going to put up on a, on a street like this, uh, this street is sending a variety of, of not-so-subtle messages that this is an environment for cars. I don't know why there are traffic lights on, on this particular street, but uh, one of my favorite phrases, a Canadian engineer named Ezra Hauer says, uh, drivers adapt to the road they see, and, and this road is you know, clearly sending a very strong message about how to behave. It reminds me of a concept that uh, Cornell University researcher Brian Wanzik calls uh, portion distortion. Uh, he's shown in studies that people will consume measurably more food when it's served to them in a larger uh, package, more so than they actually even want. He's done experiments with stale popcorn in movie theaters. People consume more stale popcorn when they eat it out of a larger uh, bucket. So I think a lot of American roads suffer from a version of this portion distortion. They're over-engineered for safety. People drive fast, and then we're, they're confused when people we're surprised when people consume all the extra safety that's been built in. So uh, this is another image from, from a small town in Texas. This is something that has been happening around the country, sort of street trees often like this are, are, are sort of torn out. Uh, is, this, is the tree a hazard or is the tree in fact a safety device? I can sort of guarantee the moment you take that tree out, speeds are going to increase, which is probably going to pose a greater risk to any, any pedestrians or cyclists on that. Uh, on that street. The tree is sort of an obvious hazard, but because of various legal liability issues, we've been tearing these things out, uh, I think, to our, to our detriment throughout the country. Now, I could go on about the problems of signs over signage. Sometimes we don't actually are, aren't able to see them. Sometimes they sort of state, uh, <laughs> state the sort of obvious. Sometimes they send, uh, sometimes we selectively obey signs based on uh, what we want to do. Uh, and, and then sometimes we, we simply don't understand what they're trying to tell us. I, I see this one in London all the time, and I, every, every time I come across it, I, I feel like I'm having a midlife crisis, and I need to, <laughs> this should be on a, a cubicle wall or something giving me a, you know, a positive life direction. But, um, uh, you know, <laughs> one of my favorite studies uh, looked at, had people try to, uh, the point here is that people often don't understand what signs are telling them, but one of my favorite studies had people look at a watch for falling rock sign Half the drivers said they would look for rocks falling in the moment and speed up. Half said they would slow down and look for rocks already on the road. So I sometimes wonder if engineers really just need to sort of spell out everything in the... Uh... <laughs> now, I'll conclude with perhaps one of the most absurd warning sign cases. This involved a moose advisories in uh, Newfoundland, Canada. There was a foggy stretch of road that was home to not only many car moose collisions, but Many collisions between cars and cars stopping to take pictures of moose. So signs, engineers figured, how can we you know, combat this problem? They uh, 
erected full-size reflective silhouettes of moose, uh, thinking that this would, would cause, uh, help the situation. Unfortunately, tourists found these pretty interesting too. <laughs> And as they slowed or stopped to take pictures of uh, the, the moose signs, the moose signs themselves became crash hotspots. Uh, the next logical step, and I, and I wish this were a joke, it actually isn't, was to create new signs that read, caution, moose signs ahead. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just take a look at the signs you see around you and wonder, you know, who's looking at them, what are they actually doing? And I, I think signs, I've come to think, represent a failure of imagination, both symbolically and literally in how to change behavior. Uh, there's evidence that Context and environmental cues can be just as, if not more, powerful. Uh, the behavioral economists Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein have been, have been arguing in their book Nudge that pushing people in the right direction through what they call choice architecture can have powerful effects, often more powerful than actually spelling out what people are supposed to do. They have a favorite example of this, which is the uh, urinals in the men's bathroom at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. Uh, this seems strange, but uh, apparently the management was upset with having to do excessive cleanups of men's careless behavior in the bathrooms at the airport. So they painted this uh, sort of little fly device here. And there was, within weeks, there was a measurable improvement in the cleanliness of the bathrooms. Uh, men were encouraged to aim for this. So no signage was required, a very simple, subtle uh, bit of uh, choice architecture here. And you think, you know, how does this apply to the world of traffic? Well, there's been some inter interesting things like Chicago's Lakeshore Drive, uh, the curve at Oak Street Beach home to a, a crash hotspot for a number of years. People tend to treat Lakeshore Drive like a sort of interstate highway, even though it's meant to be about 35 miles an hour. So at first, they, the, the, the first response was to in install more signs, sort of warning of this curve ahead. Then there were sort of larger signs, then larger flashing signs. Uh, none of this was seeming to have an effect. So they, the final approach was to sort of paint these uh, transverse parallel bars on the road that actually grow closer to one another as you get closer to the curve. The sensation you have of driving over it is that you're driving faster than you actually are. So it's sort of increasing your sense of risk without actually increasing the risk. It, it creates a sort of a sense of confusion. You slow down. Uh, accident rate has, uh, according to the Chicago Department of Transportation, gone down 36%. They've actually added some signage, which has made it go down even more. But the key point is, just with this innovative paint treatment, they were able to affect uh, a big sort of change in that. So, uh, you know, and it's not always about adding paint. Sometimes removing paint is actually uh, the answer. A street, interesting study in England, looked at two roads, trying to reduce speeds on one road. So they, they took two roads, a sample road and this road, and actually removed the center line markings. And we, we've come to assume these have a safety purpose and they sort of make things better for everyone. But they found that by removing the white lines, drivers actually drove further apart and slower than they did on the road uh, with white lines, which is exactly what they were trying to do. So. Just to conclude here, uh, about sort of two thoughts uh, divided by centuries, but sort of united, that Sir Isaac Newton and Henry Barnes, former traffic commissioner in New York City, which is just uh, you know, a lot of te technology and engineering in the traffic world, but uh, there's also a great importance on the, on the human factor, which is something that I've been trying to stress in my uh, work. And I'll stop now, and uh, hopefully we'll have, a, am sure, a very productive conversation. Thank you.